Welcome to today's Atlas webinar on successful weathering testing. Before I start with the actual webinar, I would like to um, introduce the company and myself so that you know who is talking to you. Uh, after that, there will be three parts that webinar is divided in. Part 1, why weathering testing. Part 2, I will go through the key characteristics of weathering tests. And in the last, final part 3, I will discuss the weathering success factors. Emphasis will be put on the red highlighted terms here on correlation, acceleration, the instrumental technology, and the test method or testing standard. So as I said, my name is Andreas Riedel. From my strong German accent, you may have realized already that I am not an English or American native speaker. I'm a German. I'm talking to you from the Atlas European head offices in Linsengericht Altenhaslau. This is not far from Frankfurt. I myself have about 20 years experience in material product performance testing and standards development, 13 years of that in the field of weathering. If you um, have questions or need a copy of that presentation afterwards, don't hesitate to send me an, an email. You will find my updated email address, so please note this is not the uh, right one. I have a new one, an updated one. You'll find that at the end of that presentation, also my phone number, and don't hesitate to ask me, and I will get back to you. The company Atlas is relatively old. Um, we have a long tradition. We are looking back very proudly. So the beginnings of our um, company were not made in weathering testing. Actually, our forefathers developed, produced, and sold lighting systems for stage lighting for the movie industry. You see an example on that slide here. All these lamps you see here back then were carbon arc lamps. And uh, uh, as you may know, carbon arc, unfiltered carbon arc lamps have a very high portion of UV radiation in their spectral power distribution. And so uh, it uh, didn't take long that the actors got a very nice uh, suntan and also their costumes faded. It was only a small step then to develop the first so-called fadometer, which is an instrument or was an instrument to assess the effect of radiation, of light, of UV and visible radiation on textile dyes and to observe and to induce the fading of those dyes, the discoloration of the textiles in an accelerated way. This was the, actually the first light fastness testing instrument and later on this uh, technology was equipped with humidity control and the spray systems and so on and then uh, we had the first weathering testing instrument. Today we are operating a global network of production sites, of outdoor test sites, weathering testing laboratories in Europe and in US, also an outdoor site in Chennai in India. You see all these dots on that on that map here. These are our locations. In many countries we have own offices or uh, offices within our mother company Amitec. We are a business unit of Amitec um, and in other countries we are operating with sales and ser technical service partners. Our product and services portfolio spans over all kinds of chambers and instruments for testing solar load influence of weather factors, weathering as we say, uh, from benchtop, like you see in the upper right picture, to uh, big drive-in chambers for the automotive industry or for the aircraft industry or other big specimens, big uh, products to be exposed. Everything in this uh, in between uh, we provide either as standard solutions or as custom built instruments and chambers. I mentioned our network of weathering testing sites already. Here you see a couple of yeah, aerials and aerial and also some uh, snapshots from our exposure sites. This is from our site in Miami, the upper left picture here. You see there are more than one million specimens on exposure. 
this is subtropical uh, climate and in contrast to that on the lower right side you see the desert sun exposure test center DSET in Phoenix or near Phoenix Arizona in the desert this is a typical desert climate with high temperatures and high irradiance and very dry conditions. These two sites, by the way, are the world's biggest outdoor exposure test sites. There's all kinds of technology available for outdoor exposure and all the different chambers for laboratory exposure, but this is not a an, an product or instrument or technology presentation. Um, this is an overview about how to help you um, to make your weathering testing successful, so this should suffice for the time being with regard to services and instruments and weathering. I do not want to forget that we are also providing consulting services to our customers, which is essentially test method and test strategy development, and we are also providing and offering a couple of seminars and a workshop program. You are uh, also listening right now to one of these client education programs. We have a whole uh, serious portfolio of different webinars on different topics. Just check out our website and if you would like to visit or would like to send one of your colleagues or your co-workers to a Fundamentals of Weathering class, just check out when the next month will be. We are offering those in different countries around the world in different languages. This was the introduction so that you uh, have an idea who is talking to you and from which company I am coming from. And now let's go into the topic here. Part one, relatively short, why weathering testing? Probably many of you know already what, uh, what the reason is, but uh, for those of you who are not so familiar with weathering testing, I would like to briefly go through that. Let's start with an example. This is the Raymond James Stadium in Tampa Bay, Florida. And uh, as you see, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have a bright red as their color. And that's the reason why all the supporters wearing bright red shirts here. And also the seats in this stadium were equipped in the bright red color when they built that stadium. But what happened after a couple of seasons? You see it here. After a couple of seasons, the bright red faded into a pink. And this was quite embarrassing. <laughs> uh, you can imagine how the others, the other team supporters laughed at them. And also, it was quite embarrassing and costly for the producer of these seats. And this is uh, no secret here. It's just a from a newspaper about 50,000 seats and the seat bottoms, which was about $1.5 million, which I would consider to be cheap. Um, it could be, could be much, could have been much more here. But uh, you, you know, these things can happen if you don't have a grip on, if you don't get, get a grip and don't have control about your weathering testing processes into a weathering testing strategy, because the reason here was just the so-called, that's what the journalist writes, UV inhibitor was forgotten, missing. They just forgot to stabilize the seeds, the colored seeds, the red seeds against the influence of UV and probably also visible light. So UV absorber, UV uh, um, uh, stabilizers were just forgotten. This is uh, something that would have been revealed very early if proper weathering testing um, were done before. So, as a consequence, to avoid this kind of disaster, do testing, do weathering testing, and not only do the tests, but do the right tests. Weathering is unfortunately not a self-standing discipline or science at universities or colleges. So as uh, at least to my knowledge, we don't have a professor or we don't have a, a college class on weathering exclusively or you can't, you know, finish university or college as a weathering engineer or a master in weathering or something like that. Unfortunately not. But we have quite a good idea what um, uh, a weathering engineer and we have many of them in many 
uh, companies should know about and what teams should know and should have expertise in if they are dealing with weathering. So weathering in one sentence is a combined effort of several disciplines to understand, measure, predict, simulate and accelerate the property changes of materials, parts and products that occur due to the combined impact of weather factors, primary and secondary natural and artificial weather, weather factors. And I would like to briefly explain what all that is. So I talked about the disciplines. Weathering is not an own discipline. It is truly interdisciplinary. You see here different fields of expertise that may be combined to solve a certain weathering problem or weathering topic. For example, erythema research in the field of biology, if the question is to find out how long a sunscreen protection product uh, actually protects against the sun, this is all real. So these kind of things are done and also you need uh, somebody from the conservation um, science if you're dealing with protection of artwork in museums from, from solar radiation or even from the light emitted by the lamps. Uh, so this is not complete, but this would be a nice curriculum for a weathering engineer college class course. This is the interdisciplinary nature of weathering. Now let's look at the weather factors. We have so-called primary and so-called secondary weather factors. Primary are the three factors, solar radiation in the UV visible in infrared. Second one is water in all its different uh, physical states like dew, condensation, rain, snow, ice, air humidity and so on. And the third is heat, but also cyclic changes, heat, cold changes, freeze, freeze, thaw cycles and so on. So three primary factors, solar radiation, heat and water. And all the others actually are called secondary weather factors, like biological agents, mildew, birds droppings, algae, insects, fungi and so on man-made air pollutants or natural air pollutants, um, sand, abrasion, um, and dirt and dust and so on and so on. There are more of those. These are just some here. You see salt water, acid rain, uh, NH3, ammonia, which you find, for example, in rural areas, um, uh, in farms and so on. So this, this is not a complete list, but this is just a yeah, collection of the most common, most frequent stresses on your material and your product. And all these stresses are acting simultaneously. They are acting together on the material, on the product and causing microscopic changes environmental aging on the microscopic scale and if the uh, aging processes accumulate to a certain level then you can see, it actually can see the appearance changing or you can measure the change in function. For example, embrittlement or tensile strength, electrical um, properties and so on. And if these property changes exceed a certain level which is depending on the level, um, on, the, on the performance expectation, on the property change, on the property itself and so on, then we have a failure, a failure of the product. The failure is you can't avoid it. It, it comes uh, definitely some time, but the question is does the failure occur within the warranty period or after the warranty period. I guess everybody is interested or should be interested in failures um, to occur not within but after the warranty period. Otherwise, we have a so-called pre-major failure. And this is one of the purposes of weathering, to find out how long products live so that you can design and can give the right statements of your warranty, product warranties. So these weather factors are acting on your product, on your material and causing several changes. I'm, I just would like to show you some of them. These are thermal effects here. You see shrinking uh, and here's no shrinking. 
reference specimens. Uh, the same here, rust, of course, corrosion. Um, this is corrosion, it's a true weather effect. Yeah. Then caused by the factors of weather, uh, or at least by some of them, at least water and oxygen. Here you have flaking, uh, delamination on wooden substrates, on metal substrates. This car looks really bad here. Um, this is peeling paint of a wooden house or building. Textile fading. As I told you before, this was where it all began many years ago. Imagine the shirt like that and then after exposure to sun and also after washing and so on, the shirt looks like that. Uh, part of it is definitely light fastness or missing light fastness. Part of it is wash fastness or whatever. Uh, here you have a faded sign, stop sign, right around the corner from where I'm talking to you right now. Doesn't look nice, this stop sign here and definitely not safe. Back here, you have the so-called blue wool scale. You see it's a different um, colored blue wool strips which fade uh, differently when exposed to the same level of light. Here you see chalking, cracking, and again, biological agents acting on um, substrates. So, to avoid that, as we said before, do weathering testing, but do the right test and do the testing right and this presentation should help you or is intended to help you to find out which test may be the right one. I can't go through the 1,300 or 200 different uh, standards here. I can't go through the uh, zillions of different materials and so on, but I will give you some general guidelines what to do. So in this part two, uh, I would like to discuss the key characteristics of weathering tests in general. So the objective of a test method or test program is to identify a failure mechanism or to compare and rank materials or to estimate or better, um, or some say predict, I think estimate is a better word, service life. So these are three different concepts used in different fields in, for research, in quality management, in the development. Um, um, department and there's a relative approach which is comparing and ranking against reference material to uh, one material against the other and the absolute approach actually uh, finding out what is the service life from weathering tests. The expectations are then that a weathering test should be realistic, fast and precise. Realistic means good correlation, good relevance, I will show you later what that is and uh, uh, no systematic errors, good trueness. Fast leads to the concept of the so-called acceleration factor and precision can be measured by doing interlaboratory tests and measuring the repeatability limit and the reproducibility limit. Let's start with correlation and relevance. Correlation is a mathematical relationship between weathering results achieved with two different tests in the field of weathering. Uh, it's usually measured using macroscopic properties yeah, like yellowness index or delta E or tensile strengths or something like that. And uh, non-parametric statistical um, methods are used frequently like rank correlation, Pearson coefficients, Spearman coefficient and so on. I would like to refer to you to the uh, common statistic literature and standards on that. In contrast to correlation, which looks at the, at the macroscopic level, relevance looks at the microscopic level. Relevance is what we call, um, or let's say, let's say that way, we call a test relevant if the test induces similar chemi chemical degradation than in real life. That means the, the, the chemical reactions, the pathways, the, um, let's say, critical photochemical products and so on should be the same like in real life. If this is not the case, then the test distorts the degradation mechanism and is not, in our terminology, relevant. 
Relevance is usually um, determined by using analytical methods, spectroscopical methods, chemiluminescence, microtoming also, all kinds of analytical methods are used here to find out if there's any distortion in the uh, chemical degradation. Both is important to look at both. A uh, good correlation of relevance is achieved by selecting or designing the most realistic test parameters in cycles and following the basic principles of good weathering testing, which means the primary weather factors have to be applied simultaneously as it happens in reality, as we saw before. The relevant secondary stresses should be included and the maximum stress levels should not be exceeded. So if you would like to test at, let's say, uh, five sun level, then you have, first you have to check what we call re reciprocity, which is very simply spoken, the effect that two photons of an energy, of a certain energy, uh, cause exactly twice the damage than one photon of a certain energy. Um, this is reciprocity, simplified, spoken, and uh, you should check that. If you don't, if you are not sure, then don't exceed one sun level. Also with the temperature, don't choose a temperature which is higher than the maximum temperature occurring outdoors or occurring in end use, I should say. If this is 85 Celsius, uh, as measured by, for example, Renault on cars roofs, then the test also should specify 85 Celsius. If you specify 100 Celsius, then there are two dangers. One danger is that you just throw away uh, good formulations because they fail but would never fail in reality. The other danger is that you dramatically over-design your products to conditions that will not occur in reality. But be careful what is real life. This is not very much, uh, uh, not, not commonly defined. Is it uh, end use conditions? Is it, is it a benchmark climate? Are uh, real life conditions those of a field test? And also take care, correlation is not causality, not necessarily. Factors that may decrease correlation are listed here. I don't want to read all that uh, different uh, bullet points here. They are taken out of two basic standards that I would like to recommend to those of you who don't know them. It's ISO 4892 part 1 and ASTM G151. These two standards are very similar, but they are extremely helpful in giving basic guidance and also some warnings um, how to do weathering testing and how to avoid common pitfalls and how to avoid mistakes and errors and where you can find uh, further information about how to evaluate uh, your specimens and so on. How to use the right light sources with the right filters and so on. So I would like to recommend these two um, very much to you these two standards. Second factor that we looked, key characteristics that we looked uh, at before is the acceleration. So you need a fast test, you don't want to wait for years to get, uh, to get a statement about the aging of your material. Of course there are limits, but you would like to have high acceleration and the acceleration factor is nothing else than the exposure time outdoor and the ex divided by the exposure time in an accelerated test, whatever that is, to induce similar changes in properties on replicate specimens. So if you need, for example, for delta E uh, of 4 or something like that, if you need 12 months outdoors and one month in the instrument uh, with a certain uh, specific test procedure, then the acceleration factor is 12, for example. Acceleration is achieved by simulating the most relevant weathering parameters at higher intensity, but as mentioned before, don't exceed the maximum values that occur outdoors. Uh, be careful um, not to intensify the weathering parameters too much. You must make a compromise between correlation and acceleration. Normally, the higher the acceleration, uh, the more risk you put on uh, the correlation or on the property of the weathering test being realistic or relevant. Uh, I have to mention that there's no universal acceleration factor. A very 
frequent question in weathering testing is how fast is a CNR instrument compared to outdoors? And the only true, there's only one true answer that you can give to this question. One. One answer. And this answer is it depends. Really, it depends on many different factors. Um, I show you some of them here. Acceleration factor depends on the parameters of the laboratory test. Of course, there are hundreds of different test cycles and each cycle gives a different uh, acceleration. Also, the reference outdoor location, the acceleration compared to Florida, Chennai, um, compared to Middle Europe, Boston, or Townsville, or uh, Japan. Uh, and the different different towns in Japan is different, of course. Uh, the acceleration factor depends also on the material, on the property you are looking at. So there actually may be different acceleration factors for yellowing and for, let's say, gloss loss of a certain specific material uh, with the same methodology. This is true. I can't give you examples here. It's just not uh, enough time. But uh, uh, there is... Um, there's literature about that, and at first, just look into the standards that I just mentioned to you. There are also secondary factors, uh, the actual outdoor conditions, so the years are different. So if you compare to Florida, do you compare to a long uh, yearly average, or to 2003, or to May, to October? Um, unexpected secondary weathering factors of the outdoor location also may distort your acceleration, like storms or biological factor, sometimes there is a certain species that just starts to grow somewhere and eats up paint or whatever. So there is a lot of, of things to be, be careful and to watch before you talk about acceleration factors. And these standards that I just mentioned, ACMG 151 and ISO 4892 Part 2 and Part 1, they are very, very, very clearly warning to use the word acceleration factor. Um, they, these standards would, or the committees that wrote the standards would like to ban the word acceleration factor. Um, it's almost as traumatic. Um, I would say, if as long as you know what you are talking about and what you are doing, and as long as you know the limits of all that, the limitations, then you can use acceleration factor. But be careful. An acceleration factor normally cannot be calculated, but it can be estimated using the Arrhenius concept for temperature and the reciprocity concept for irradiance. Um, these are very rough estimates. Um, first, um, Arrhenius is a simplification. Second, reciprocity is in most cases not um, valid. And third, there's no way nowadays to calculate the influence of water. Not yet. Maybe in 20 years, or maybe in 200 years, maybe in 50 years, we have uh, algorithms to calculate the influence of water on polymers or other um, um, materials, but nowadays it's not possible. So I must say that the, the estimation of acceleration factors is very, very rough. It's like, let's say, predicting the weather for the next two weeks from just observing the sky. Yeah. If you are very experienced, you may come up with some real good estimates, but you also may be wrong. Limits of acceleration <laughs> are uh, everywhere within weathering. Uh, field because acceleration is one of the most important uh, topics in weathering. Uh, if you can't wait for 20, uh, 21 days um, at 35 Celsius to produce chicken out of an egg, if you would like to speed that up, the results can be very unexpected. And uh, this is this is something to laugh at, but uh, things like that in a figurative sense happen in every day's laboratory practice. Third characteristic of a weathering test is the, or next one, is precision. Precision can be measured very well 
by um, measuring the repeatability limit and the reproducibility limit. Repeatability is the ability of a test to produce the same or similar results in replicate specimens in the same laboratory by the same operator using the same equipment within short time intervals. So repeat the test one after the other after the other with replicate specimens and then look at uh, the results and the results from the results you can then derive using the, 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 the formulas and the standards and the guidelines under repeatability conditions you can calculate the repeatability limit. And if then the result of a repeated test is bigger than the repeatability limit, then you should be careful something may have gone wrong or you have a systematic error in it or something like that. Um, reproducibility is similar to repeatability, only that it is done in different laboratories or two weeks later or by different operators or in different weathering instruments and you can measure that also by interlaboratory uh, round robin studies and uh, can also uh, calculate the reproducibility limit. According to the, um, let's say, the pure theory, each test should be validated by determining the relevance and the correlation and also reproducibility and repeatability. Each weathering test also, but in weathering this is done very, very seldom because weathering tests take so long and are not I, I would say are not cheap. They cost time and resources and efforts. So unfortunately in in most cases, maybe in more than ninety percent of the cases, nobody ever um, calculated or measured the repeatability and reproducibility limits, which means the precision of a test. Experience helps here to evaluate the results anyway. High precision can be achieved by combining state-of-the-art instrument technology, test methods, evaluation processes, and um, uh, methods and the processes that you are using. And I will come back to that a little bit later in part three. Uh, another um, word that is used very often is trueness. In, uh, in contrast to precision, trueness um, expresses how close you are to the actual, the true value. Of course, <laughs> it's not easy to determine what the true value is. Uh, do you uh, refer to environmental conditions, to benchmark conditions, or to uh, the results of a field test, or to, to samples taken out of the, uh, from the customer, out of the field, or something like that? This has to be defined. Uh, an analogon shows the difference here between trueness and precision. At the left side, there's high trueness, so the average falls right in the center here. Relatively low precision, so the shooter should practice a little bit more. Here you have some, uh, you have a good shooter, definitely, but probably some uh, some problem with your optics or with, your, with some systematic error in the gun. So this is the difference between trueness and precision. Let me summarize this part. The key characteristics for a successful weathering test is, is the test realistic? Is it fast? Is it precise? Uh, that leads to the concepts of correlation, relevance, trueness, acceleration, precision, which is repeatability and reproducibility. And I talked about most of those um, characteristics. And in this part three, I would like to uh, build on that and discuss the factors of successful weathering testing. I divided that into four parts, weathering instrumentation, the test methods, evaluation, and the weathering processes. I will mostly elaborate on the first two, the instrumentation, the technology part, and the test method and testing standard part, and only briefly touch evaluation and weathering processes. Let's start with the instrumentation. Of course, there is, as mentioned before, uh, a whole portfolio of outdoor weathering testing technology and methods. I will not go into that. That would be topic of a um, of a specific presentation. I would like to limit or um, uh, to focus 
on laboratory weathering instrumentation, as you see here, a couple of examples. And first, um, I would like to, um, yeah, to look a little bit more into the quality of the light source that is used in weathering testing. This graph shows four different light sources and sunlight. Yellow is sunlight, average Miami. Uh, red is uh, filtered scenery arc. The green one is uh, a fluorescent lamp, three of fluorescent UVA 340 lamp, and then you have metal halide and sunshine carbon arc. You see that some of the light sources are matching quite well and some are not matching at all. The solar spectral power distribution over a bigger area. You see that xenon and metal halide are the best um, Spectral power have the best spectral power distribution if it comes to simulating of solar uh, spectral power distribution over the UV invisible. The UV cut-on is best simulated by the UVA 340 fluorescent uh, light source and xenon arc lamp. Uh, Sunshine carbon arc has much much too high uh, uh, intensity here in the UV, and uh, and also you have to note that the fluorescent lamp doesn't have any radiation in the visible area. This is important because in the visible area there also are maybe may, may um, uh, reactions, photochemical reactions that are induced by visible light in all these reactions. They, they are existing and if you don't have visible light in your spectrum you may exclude <laughs> a realistic degradation path and to distort your whole, your, your whole test. Uh, let's look into uh, in how that works in principle. This is a daylight, so-called daylight spectrum, realistic spectral power distribution similar to the sun. And this is uh, a spectral power distribution containing unrealistic high UV levels as it was used in the past very often to accelerate um, reactions. And uh, you saw faster yellowing and so on um, uh, by, by using that and then people thought, okay, it's just faster. But it's not. It's different. It's it may be faster, but it's also different. Different from reality and that's the, that's the point here. So don't use that. Why? This is the spectral sensitivity of a model polymer, this black line here. And if you multiply the spectral sensitivity of this model uh, ideal polymer with the spectral power distribution, you get the green curve here, or with this high UV um, curve, you get the red curve here. And these two, these are called activation spectra, and we know, and there's also publications and standards how to measure that, explanation and so on. And we know that this activation spectrum is a measure of how much damage is done photochemically in the in the material? You see, and this is completely different. It's not only in quantity; it's also in quality because you have high um, energy photons here that may induce certain um, changes or cert uh, excite certain uh, molecules to certain molecular levels, which will never or may never happen with realistic spectral power distribution over the sun because the sun just don't uh, provide these high um, energy photons on uh, Earth's surface. So this is uh, the reason why you should take very much care for the right, for the realistic spectral power distribution. This is also the reason why this is one of the biggest topic for 80 years now in weathering testing and uh, there's a lot of innovation uh, going on here and observed from instrument to instrument generation, from filter system to filter system, from lamp technology to lamp technology over history. Just talk to the experts and uh, you will understand what what you can do where the um, nowadays technology stands. So this was the spectral power distribution, the, light, the quality of light. Now let's look into the geometry of the weathering instrument. Here you have three different geometries. Static horizontal, as is the specimen, tray or sample surface. Rotating rack, so this is rotating around the radiation source, R, the light source. 
Here the light source is shining from above on a static tray. Here these specimens are rotating in the chamber around the, uh, the light source. And here the light source is static and irradiating um, uh, upright vertical specimen area. So these are the three uh, commonly used geometries. I'll show you examples for that. So this is something like the instrument looks like that. Here you have the, the common um, UV fluorescent instruments. They are all more or less like that, independent from which manufacturer, because this is standardized. Um, this geometry, and here you have a typical lamp in the middle and rotating rack or rotating drum. Some say um, specimen rack uh, rotating around the lamp. Why? I will show you with data why that is. Uh, let's compare rotating rack and static horizontal. This is just a smaller instrument with one lamp here. And if you yeah, put that to the side here, if it were possible, it's a big instrument, it's not possible, but uh, just for, the, for showing the data, then you can look at these data here. And this is specimen positions, one, two, three, four, five, six, from bottom to top. You saw that we rotated that instrument <coughs> at different fan speeds. Don't, don't care about that. I'm just showing that it, it, the uh, conditions stay the same here. Minus 5, plus 5 Celsius. And you see the maximum deviation in temperature. If you have a black standard temperature of 95 Celsius, which is quite high, the maximum deviation is below 2% from that 1.7 Celsius. That's quite quite narrow. Here you have a maximum deviation of 7 Celsius if you have a black standard of 70. You see where the lamp is, you have a very mm, um, low temperature. Here you have high temperatures. Um, why there's an air stream here, cooling and so on, and you don't move it around, you don't, uh, there are no means to <coughs> actually make the, uh, the, the temperature more uniform over the sample area. So some manufacturers offer then uh, small specimen trays that you have to rotate uh, to a certain, certain frequency. You have to take care for that these samples rotate from one position to the other. But if you uh, get much more temperature than you think, maybe 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 more than average, uh, you may get a problem, distortion of um, of the um, degradation mechanism if you have a very sensitive material or um, sensitive product here. So take care. What I would like to show you just is that the rotating work instruments provide a much better uniformity in temperature than the static flatbed instrument. The same applies for irradiance. That's the same with radiance, 10% uh, compared to 3 to 4% which is, um, I, I would say, a world in between. And if you know that the, uh, the material's degradation is very sensitive to very small changes in temperature and very small changes in the UV cut-on or in the radiance level, uh, then you know how dramatic these differences are. And the third aspect I would like to uh, briefly touch on is the um, constancy or the constant exposure conditions over time. So this is the time from left to right. This is always the same scale. Here you see the time. This is black panel temperature. That's the temperature on the sample. This is the humidity of the air within the chamber. This is the dry bulb temperature, which is nothing else than the temperature of the air in the chamber not on the sample, but in the chamber. And here you see these are three different generations of the instruments, of the Atlas instruments, CI 65, 65A, and CI 4000. And you see, uh, also you may read on the, on, on the, or may program the same level, like let's say 50% relative humidity, 65 um, degrees Celsius black panel temperature, and 40 Celsius uh, in uh, chamber air temperature. The, the characteristics 
uh, of controlling these conditions is completely different between the old and the new instruments. So the new instruments, by no uh, question, they are much, much better, tighter, narrower control than the older instruments. What does it mean? It means that these changes may cause extra effects, yeah, high temperature, low, high, low or humidity, uh, here, temp high temperature, low temperature. And if you know that uh, 10, 10 degrees Celsius more, double the reaction speeds in average simplified spoken, really simplified spoken average, then you know that um, this is, these are dramatic changes here um, between the different instrument generations. I would like to, um, to explain this to you because very often um, the question is, okay, does, does the new instrument generation give exactly the same results like the old 40-year-old instrument, even if I can program all the values in it. Normally, there are good reasons why it should not. Yeah. And these reasons are technical progress. This is a checklist here that you uh, may use internally in your laboratory environment to uh, yeah, make sure you think of all these different things here. We are also using these checklists when we are working together with customers in a little bit different format, of course. Uh, but these are just, let's say, the most important topics you should think of, you should go or implement into your processes in the laboratory. The test methods that's, and the standards, that's a universe for its own. You have all the different um, um, yeah, organizations here um, on different levels. And you have performance-based and instrument-specific standards, basic standards, material product standards. You have testing and product standards, consensus-based or industry or company test methods, all this, uh, these different things. I know very well um, how to find a way through this jungle because for about 15 years I have been active in standards development, being convener and chairman of standards groups, international and national, in many different fields. So this is something you need a guide through, definitely. You need a guide through this jungle here. And uh, very often people are, um, they are lose their, uh, let's say, lose their, their way and are helpless to identify this ISO standard really the right one. How he, I have two different versions of an SAE, SAE standard. What is the difference? Which cycle number should I apply? And how to how how is that uh, uh, the meaning behind this uh, um, clause in this ATCC standard and so on and so on. So this is something that that you should take care um, that you are using the standards in the right version, that you communicate in the right way, that you designate um, your results uh, completely so that there are no um, misunderstandings. And you would be surprised how many misunderstandings, how many yeah, sometimes even um, lawsuits are uh, fought just because um, different results were created with different methods, but those that are arguing here think that they use the same method. Just using, let's say, ISO 11341 is not guaranteeing that you actually have the same parameters in the test. The purpose of an artificial weathering standard is actually always to induce uh, similar degradation as in a specific reference climate by simulating the relevant weathering parameters at high intensity but not too high within tight tolerances. And this leads to what we discussed before, correlation relevance, acceleration precision. Um, this is, uh, let's say, the basic framework for an artificial weathering standard, but unfortunately many of those standards do not meet these objectives. You can't say from the first glance which standards do and which don't meet, but there are older ones and only those who were um, active in the standards committees and know what was decided know why a specific wording is in the standard. To, normally to satisfy a certain 
uh, party around the table because you have to know that um, the international standards, the ISO and the IEC standards are all consensus based. So if somebody uh, doesn't like a wording, then okay, you say good, okay, if, uh, unless agreed otherwise or if agreed by the interesting par interested parties or may and all this kind of things. So it's, it's a jungle, as I said, it's a jungle by itself. And if you would like to uh, develop an own test method and uh, don't find one in the shelf for your material, for your application, which is relatively frequently uh, this occurs, that there are standards on plastics, yeah, a couple of them, also a standard on uh, PVC window profiles, there are standards on plastic bumpers and on uh, housings for electronic equipment and so on and so on. But uh, for most of the specific uh, applications and products, um, many people just don't find the right standards um, to apply. And therefore, we have developed the seven-step procedure for developing a veteran test method. It's not rocket science. It's not, you know, inventing the wheel from the beginning. We just uh, used what uh, the weathering community and what others, the statistics and the reliability engineers and the meteorologists and the meteorologists and, and so on, what they know and we are just combining that. Normally we uh, start with specifying scope or objective and then doing a modified product FMEA with the customer, um, researching the real stress factors in worst case, modeling the whole thing and coming then up with a test program design. Test program normally has more than one test method. Uh, the pass fail criteria have to be identified and uh, implementation is actually doing the test. Uh, normally there, there are screening phases, screening one, two, three and then uh, uh, the actual test and then the uh, validation uh, phase tells you if the test is uh, correct or not or if you have to you know, fine-tune or change here and there. Um, this is very often that uh, artifacts are created by specific uh, parameters, by spe specific uh, weathering conditions, and then you go in an iterative way, you go back to the test program design, change a little bit and implement again. Uh, this is very roughly uh, shown the seven-step procedure. There are publications about that. If you are interested in, you can uh, you, I can send you an article about that or there's a special webinar on that also. I don't want to go into the detail right now, I just want to give you a checklist again for test method and standard uh, that you may uh, use. So these are these bullet points most important and for evaluation and the process I only wanted to give you these kind of checklists. Please be aware that evaluation methods like color measurement, gloss measurement and so on um, also have their uncertainty and their precision. So these, there are also uh, specific things to, to consider before you start the weathering test. All, also the sample size, geometry and so on has to be uh, chosen in uh, accordance to the evaluation methods that uh, you are looking at. And the weathering processes include things like training and education of your staff, like uh, uh, communication information, how do you deal with interfaces, how do you communicate results and so on, how to integrate a certain test or test program into a, a laboratory strategy or into an environment of different uh, instruments. Uh, all these things are summarized under weathering processes. Let me come to the end. In summary, first, my first statement was do weathering testing, but do the testing right. In the second part of today's presentation, I explained the key characteristics, being realistic, fast and precise of uh, weathering tests and uh, um, the, uh, briefly touched on the concepts of correlation, relevance, trueness, acceleration, repeatability and reproducibility. And in the third part, I explained to you um, uh, some of the basic aspects 
to be uh, taken care for uh, if you would like to successful like to be successful in your weathering testing and uh, I deal with that I dealt with that uh, in four let's say buckets here the weathering technology the test method or testing standard evaluation and weathering processes only very very short I hope that was a little bit food for thought for you I hope it was a little bit helpful for your day-to-day -day practice in the uh, laboratory. Please apologize that I can't present case studies. I can't go into detail, can't talk about PMMA, PA uh, or PC or whatever. I can't go into instrumental details. Um, you may know the uh, may want to know the difference between black panel and black standard and um, how correlation is determined and where the limitations are and all these different things, um, how different materials age and um, how you test paints or whatever. These are so many things I, I just can't even touch in this very, very short one hour. Um, please don't hesitate to contact my colleagues. We have uh, skillful and very experienced uh, knowledge colleagues uh, on both sides of the Atlantic in Asia and USA and in Europe. And uh, just uh, check out on our website who the nearest Atlas uh, contact partner is. And uh, my colleagues and also I myself, we are always happy to help you and to answer questions and to guide you to, uh, uh, to the right solution if you need more help. Um, so this is this is it for today. Thank you very much, and for your for your participation. And uh, I hope you benefited from uh, from this webinar. If you would like to get a version of this presentation, just send me an email. I see that this email address is not the right one. I I'm I'm sorry for that. So my right email address is Andreas A N D R E A S Andreas dot R I E D L Riedel at Ametech A M E T E K dot D E Andreas dot Riedel at Ametech dot D. Thank you very much and have a great day.